Hello and welcome to our look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. With me, as I said, our writer and broadcaster, Vicky Beeching, James Lyons from the Sunday Mirror. Thank you both for coming in. Let's start with those front pages then. And the Daily Telegraph is leading with Labour's plans to apparently cap spending on the state pension. The Guardian has its exclusive on the US whistleblower who leaked details of the US surveillance programmes. The Daily Mail's front cover discusses online por child pornography. And the Daily Telegraph is, uh, I beg your pardon, it's the Times uh, leading on talks of an Irish uh, bailout, a backdoor deal funded by British taxpayers. God, my eyesight hasn't failed. You can see that front, front page from here. Uh, let's uh, make a start then and we'll, we'll deal with the, the Guardian first, which for days has been sort of drip feeding us, hasn't it, with um, details of these allegations, which is all they are at the moment about how uh, US authorities have uh, apparently been uh, s snooping on, on people's um, online communications. Here we have on the front page, if we can see it now, the whistleblower, uh, a man called Edward Snowden, who's, in twen who's 29 and has been uh, interviewed for The Guardian in uh, Hong Kong and admits, James, that he might not be going home to the US in a hurry. Yes, yes. Um, uh, it seems to be an extremely brave um, uh, and extremely sincere young man. Um, some might argue misguided, um, but he certainly doesn't appear to be under any misapprehension about what his future holds. He's um, an extremely interesting interview that he's given to The Guardian where he talks about the fact not only that he won't be going home, but also that he's going to have to sever his connections with um, family and loved ones, and he fears that the security forces uh, from the US will go after them. And says he's pinning his hopes, Vicky, on seeking asylum somewhere like like Iceland, Iceland yeah. uh, but it has so many echoes doesn't it of Julian Assange from the, from WikiLeaks uh, and also Bradley Manning of, and neither Absolutely. of whom were, were dealt with sympathetically by the US. No I do think it really speaks volumes about his bravery like James said it's it's one thing to kind of leak these things and another thing to actually stand up and say this is who I am. Um, a lot of my academic research actually looks at the ethics of technology and the different minefields that are coming up as we move into the, the depths of the internet and this is a really interesting one you know privacy versus security and uh, for me he's really taken on hero status already I think he's he's done a great work in in seeing things that go against his conscience and being willing to stand up and be identified I think it's great but just we've also had the, the US spy chief James Clapper complaining about the sort of irresponsible nature of reports like this by the Guardian though and um, at the moment these are only allegations by this man aren't they well um, they, they are only allegations you say although I haven't really seen anyone comprehensively knocking them down um, and William Hague complaining Hague's about them but not complaining them exactly mm. exactly which is the kind of form of confirmation I would say but there we go mm. um, I mean um, you know William Hague's been very careful with his words today he hasn't discussed what um, what exactly the uh, British GCHQ listening post has been uh, up to in all of this um, he has said they're not using it to get around British laws but he's not saying that they're not using it that's no the, he that's hasn't it's very interesting thing. the form of words that he's chosen to use when he seems he's very been. cautious isn't it and uh, I was tweeting um, yesterday actually it was the anniversary of the publication of George Orwell's 1984 and uh, I just think the timing of it all is fascinating that's one of my favorite books and uh, I do think this con constant question of Big Brother is really bearing down on all of us. Yes, and, and in the interview that um, is now posted on the Guardian website, but don't leave us now to watch it, do it later, um, Edward Snowden talks about uh, the mechanisms by which the procedures that the US authorities he claims have used uh, and how it, how it works, the sort of the, the nuts and bolts of it, and saying that he doesn't want to live in, the world, in a world where this is just blithely accepted. Yes, but I mean, equally, you'll have people making the case that um, this is exactly what's required. I mean, um, there were there was a, the former the MOD's former head of cyber security was out today, saying that actually people should be delighted that this was going on. You know, we're only weeks away from the, the horrific events in Woolwich, the terrible killing of that soldier, um, Lee Rigby down at the down at the barracks there, and uh, and this is exactly the sort of thing you need to do in the internet age. And these arguments aren't new. I mean, if you look back at um, what happened with the founding of what became MI5, um, you know, they they were were opening post left, right and centre, you know, it's, it's, some might argue that's just a modern day equivalent. Let's look at the Telegraph then and we'll start with the, the Labour plan to cap the state pension. Or are they planning that? We don't know. The article says that um, there seems to be some confusion. The policy was thrown into confusion after Labour insisted that it would honour guaranteed increases in payments. And Vicky, you wonder whether this would be a bit of an own goal if Labour did decide to do this because 
the sort of section of the electorate you can rely on to turn out to vote are older people. Exactly, and that really is why they're such a, a sensitive demographic. They are the people you know will come out and vote, and uh, people my age and younger tend to really struggle to kind of buy into voting in the same way. That frustrates me because I think it's very, very important that we do. But, uh, you know, you start targeting them, potentially saying you're going to cap uh, their benefits, and it's, it's dangerous. But um, if you look at the figures here, it says that um, 110 billion of the total of 165 billion of benefits is actually uh, on the welfare for pensioners. So something has to be cut to make, to make ends meet. That's the conundrum, isn't it? When we've been talking for months now about how do you cut the welfare bill, the majority of it goes to people who are claiming pensions. And if you, if you impoverish them, you end up having to pay them Mm. other benefits to, to make up for the shortfall. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the point that Ed Balls was making today was that um, really spending in this area is too big to ignore, so it has to go into this cap that the Labour have followed the government in saying needs to happen on welfare spending. Um, what, what the Labour was subsequently saying is they're not talking about whole cancelling pension rises, um, but looking at maybe other ways of doing this, they could, for example, look at raising the um, retirement age again. Um, the coalition are raising it to 66 in the not-too-distant future, that will go up to 67 in 2026. Um, Labour could, could go even further, uh, and that could be one way that you would cap spending um, because obviously it would, it would make huge savings. Picture there on the Daily Telegraph of Rafael Nadal's record eighth time win at the French Open. He's still only 27. It's a brilliant it? photo, isn't it? Isn't it looks it? like he's just been uh, shot or something. <laughs> he's obviously happy, but he looks a bit like he's in He'll terrible pain. He'll be covered pain. in clay when he gets up. I don't suppose he cares about <laughs> that. Terrible to get out of that top. It will be. But I don't suppose he needs to worry. He'll probably throw it into the crowd. So congratulations to him. and. Uh, uh, it must have been quite a match, you know, playing against fellow countryman David Ferrer. Uh, the Times, uh, first of all, the lead story, the Irish bailout that apparently has cost British taxpayers an extra £10 billion uh, in an arrangement that was never explicitly approved by Parliament. How did that come about, James? Well, um, what they're talking about here is support for something called Ulster Bank, which uh, is, is a subsidiary of RBS, which, as we all know, we've all been uh, propping up and paying for for quite some considerable time now. And what the Times has found is that the, um, the, the £10 billion that went into RBS has ended up um, propping up this offshoot, which mainly operates in in the Republic of Ireland. Um, so the Times are arguing that that's an extra subsidy to the Irish. In fact, uh, they've got an unnamed Tory minister here saying that actually the, the, the government missed a trick and they should have hived this off to the Irish when they negotiated the support that we did give them uh, as a bailout a few years ago. Um, I, I don't think it means that we've actually tonight ended up spending an extra 10 billion. I think it just uh, the argument is that actually the Irish should have spent it instead. The, the problem is with all these sort of financial uh, deals is that debt uh, is owned by so many different people and uh, everything's so enmeshed and intertwined, mm -hmm. isn't it, you know, that um, it is a truly globalised problem and it, you know, you, you it don't, if you don't help another mm -hmm. bank out, it, chickens come home to roost close to time. Absolutely, but I, I think what it's really stressing here is the, the, the need for accountability and if Parliament uh, aren't accountable and the British public aren't really kept in the loop about what's happening, these kind of things can be unsettling, I suppose. Let's look at um, the uh, Ian Banks photograph there, who's died at the age of um, 59. I mean, it appeared that he had got a few more months to live, and then suddenly, obviously, uh, the cancer got the better of him. Um, some fantastic tributes being paid to him yeah. today. Yeah. An extraordinary writer. I mean, the books that I read were like nothing I'd ever, ever encountered by anyone else, particularly... He did th break the, the mould, yeah. Yeah, he did, yeah. the Wasp Factory. The Wasp Factory and was just finished great. one of his novels. Yeah, the St Stonehouse, one of his later, later books. And, I mean, it was only this morning that we were reading that actually he, he had another book plan which was all about his illness and uh, a guy in his position who was, who was facing sort of his final final months. I don't know quite what this, this sad news will mean today because it, it certainly has come as a bit of a shock. Yes, the Friends were talking about he just started driving sports cars again and uh, anyway there we go. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was expecting to live longer because yeah. it said here that the, the 3rd of April was when he announced he would have uh, possibly a year but not beyond that and uh, obviously it's all happened a lot quicker but his um, his final book is actually going to be coming out on the 20th of June. It's been brought forward. Uh, it's been brought forward. It's called yeah. Quarry and it's his final novel.
let's look very quickly if we can we'll, we'll spend more time on this at half past 11 but uh, the daily mail only one in 15 online child porn suspects is arrested it's emerged uh, child protection suspects alerting police to nearly 3,000 suspects last year but just 192 of them were detained I mean, this is another story that's um, ha getting a great deal of coverage of this, this issue of late isn't it absolutely yeah I mean we've uh, had that uh, bizarre case of the teacher who wasn't um, barred from from teaching after downloading pornography that came to light last week we've had the Prime Minister over the weekend talking very tough about um, what he wants to see internet companies like Google doing in terms of stopping this stuff getting out there um, uh, which obviously is vital uh, but then a story like this comes along and you think well um, surely they should be using the existing laws uh, you know much better than they are before they um, before they start trying to tack new things onto it it's, I mean, it's, the article says that chief constables apparently see this crime as a low priority I mean, mm. that, that isn't the kind of message that you hear no, it's from not, the police no, when they the, speak publicly about The NSPCC are really in uproar saying that they feel like offenders should feel the full force of the law and I absolutely agree with them. I think again it comes back to that age-old kind of internet ethics question of you know privacy versus policing and uh, people really want to be free to look at anything they want but I think when it involves children we have to draw the line and say we have to bring in stronger protection, stronger enforcement We'll leave it for there for the moment. That's the papers for this hour. But uh, Vicky and James will be back uh, at half past 11. We'll take another look at uh, the front pages now here on BBC News. Stay with us because coming up next is Click. <laughs>